Welcome to the creative community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is poet Nina Clemens. Nina, welcome. Thank you. Well, we are going to admit it, this is going to be poetry mania. <laughs> we have a lot of poems from you. Your poems tend to be short, so yes. we're going we're gonna to hear as many poems as we can squeeze in. That's awesome. Um, but before we do, I, I know that you got your MFA from Sarah Lawrence in fiction writing. Yes. Um, you're, I think of you know, primarily as a poet now. Yes. Um, tell me a little bit, not just about the graduate school, but how you got from childhood to graduate school as a writer. Yeah, so I wrote poems really young. Um, my dad gave me a book of Edgar Allan Poe's poetry, mm -hmm, sure. um, and that was the first book I ever received. I still have it. And I read those poems obsessively and wrote a lot of poems that rhymed. Right. Um, a lot of rhyme. Good, good training, I think. Yeah. Know, even if you don't end up rhyming. Yeah, I still do. I still play around with rhyme yeah. a little bit, but not as much as I did in those days. And so I always wrote poems and stories, but my stories were always very poemy, and my story and my poems were very, you know, narrative. Mm -hmm. So they've always kind of blurred. Yeah. the genres and when I went to grad school I had this series of prose poems um, about different women living in an apartment building and decided to turn that into a novel and oh, so I have yeah. a novel that I've been working on for a long time about these um, young college-age women kind of living together and in the Midwest mm -hmm. and sort of you know growing up coming of age Still out there, available for publication? Uh, well, I'm still writing it. I'm yeah. still oh, rewriting still working it. On it. I'm okay. still rewriting it. Um, I, I have a friend from graduate school who, um, who I exchange with, and he told me that I did not get the ending right. Okay. So I have to redo the ending. <laughs> um, but yeah, so and I've been writing poems primarily while I've been working on that novel. Mm -hmm. instead of other short fiction for some reason just a lot of poems well can we hear one of those since it's poetry mania sure yeah. sure so um, I'm gonna read maybe I'll read a couple poems from my chapbook called set the table okay um, this one is called the kitchen when it's all used up between us there will still be a kitchen a cracked floor to sweep chipped plates to scrape and one perfect red table. But now there is only the high-pitched whistle, louder than cicadas, higher than live wire, that fine chord of silence. Mm. And then I have um, another one called The Seven House Man. In his seventh house, the man rests easily and eats nothing but sesame seeds. He fries them and sucks the oil as he swallows, spitting out the occasional burned seed, the hard kernel with which he can do nothing. They gather at his feet the black specks. Someone will sweep them away as he sleeps. It is the least sordid of all his houses. One and the, more maybe? Sure. Yeah. Um, this is called Come for Dinner. After you have scraped every good thing from the pan, let us sit down. Let us talk. Eat with your fingers. Let them drip tomato seeds before me. Listen. Give me your heart to hold while you chew. I will want to keep it because of its odd girth, the satisfying solidity of it against my palm. But you and I are for dinner only. You will eat, we will talk, and I will give the heart back. You know, I'm really drawn to the short poem. Um, obviously, are you? Uh, w what is it about that being able to say something less than a page or maybe a half a page that is yeah. different from the poem that goes on for two or three or four pages? Yeah, I don't have that much experience with a poem that goes on for two or three or four <laughs> pages, honestly, because I just like moments. Mm -hmm. I just want to see a moment. And so I think that's why I've been drawn to short poems and short prose 
because I really want to explore a snapshot, mm -hmm. an image. So that moment um, snapshot, would you compare a poem to a photograph? I mean, if you were, had to make an analogy with another art form. I would, yeah, I would. I don't know much about photography, but I would, I would compare them because that's, that's what I'm sort of going for. Or a scene in, an, in a film, mm -hmm. something very quick. Mm -hmm. Just one short one yes. minute scene or something like that. Yes, but that you can sort of linger with at the right. same time, like it's over very quickly, right. but you can linger with it right. and experience it fully. Well, people might think, well, it's, it can't be that hard to write a short poem, but it, it is, right? Because, I mean, you have to get as much heart into that poem as you would if you were given a number of other pages, right? Right. How, how do you decide what, what stays in and, and what stays out? Oh, everything goes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how, you know, it's just, it, I think I write a lot uh, more on the page. That I, I usually start writing in a notebook. Okay. And a lot of that stuff gets left in the notebook when it goes to the computer. Mm -hmm. um, so when I move to the computer, I kind of revise and edit and cut a lot out. Set the table, the, the, the poems seem to have a, a food connection, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> not surprisingly. Uh, how did they come together as a chapbook? So this chapbook came together over many years. Some of these poems are from my college days. Um, and I just decided, I was just looking through all the poems once when I moved to California. I just decided, well, let's look at all these poems. And I decided that they sort of fit together. Um, and there were some old ones from college, but some, some other poems from, from more recently. Uh, and I just decided to submit them as a chapbook, and, and it worked. It worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> there they are. There they are. Well, your next book is called Our Mother of Sorrows, yes. and it's a book-length poem made up of short sections. Um, Prairie Schooner was lucky enough to, um, to get uh, part of it, you know, um, and so I wonder if you could maybe read the first half of Our Mother sure. of Sorrows, and then let's stop and talk about it, and then we'll let you read sure. the second part. Sure, thank you. One, it was her knees I loved, cheek against the rough ridge. I rubbed my face into them. She sat there smoking, picking her feet only sometimes. But I loved the rough little hairs, the tiniest spikes against my skin. I wanted to break a wedge of Parmesan against those knees. I sat on the carpet and breathed in smoke. Two. There was always some man lying on the television screen. I remembered Oliver North, but I remembered his beautiful secretary more. She could not recall anything. The transcripts were expletive deleted. Mommy, what's an expletive? I understood deleting just fine, making something smaller until it disappeared. Daddy became a liar, but he wasn't on TV. It's been many years since I learned how the expletives fled, all those words like polished glass begging to be read. Three, she smoked and she smoked and never grew tired of it. Ashtrays overflowed and were emptied, but still she'd shake one loose from the pack. Always she bought them by the carton. They never lasted long. I didn't know addiction, the word or meaning, but I understood compulsion, the need to pick and pick until the nose bled, all behind the curtain, hidden from mommy, but not from the world. So that's about half. Okay. So this appears in a, a special issue about the opioid crisis. Right. But I was not part of that special section, okay. although in the intro email to the issue, I think the editor highlighted one of my poems. Mm -hmm. um, and talked about the compulsion and addiction. Right, yeah. So tell us a little bit about this book that's, that's coming out. Uh, yeah, so it's, as you said, it's one book length poem broken down into seven different sections. And I wrote it over the course of a summer, essentially. Wow. Yeah, so they all just kind of came out. Um, and I initially, I initially titled it Dearest Mommy and was imagining doing like Mommy Dearest mm -hmm. poems, but it sort of morphed and evolved into something else. And about half the poems 
are like the ones that I just read. They're focused in realism and grounded in reality. And then the other half that are all sort of mixed in together are more mythological um, and focus on, you know, the mother as harpy, the mother as snake, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, not yeah. necessarily the most flattering of images. Not the most subtle, no. Yeah, or subtle. <laughs> no, not the most flattering, but also um, not without love. You know, okay. they're not without softness okay. also. So, I mean, I guess it's okay to talk about this because we were talking about before the cameras were running. Um, you're not close with your mom, but she's still alive. She's still alive, yes. Um, it, what if she were watching this program some, on the internet, say? <laughs> Was there anything that um, you would say to her? Yeah, I would say that these poems are all born out of love, and they're sort of born out of my lived experience as her daughter mm -hmm. um, and they're they're born out of a great attention and care mm -hmm. that's what I would say I think that's one of the most difficult things that as a creative writing instructor at Santa Barbara City College that I deal with and have dealt with over my career which is what how can you write about the people that you know well especially if they're still around and, and, and might read your work I mean there's one school of philosophy that it's your experience, you own it, you get to write about it and say whatever you want to. I tend to be of that school. Um, there's another, you know, thinking that, well, we need to be gentle and we need to disguise things and so forth. Um, does that not necessarily... <laughs> I haven't disguised much. Yeah. No, and my poems are autobiographical, but they're also fictional. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I start maybe with a kernel of an image right. from the past, but then things kind of morph mm -hmm. into something else. So I guess I really do sort of subscribe to the idea that this is my experience, and I'm going to write about it. However and you want to. Yeah. However I want to. And there are consequences to that, and I deal with the consequences. And what are they? Well, I wrote, when my chapbook came out, there is a poem in here about my mother um, that's sort of very loosely based on her. And she was very angry. Mm -hmm. She read the chapbook, and she read the chapbook with an attention to detail that was not right. you know, what I had hoped right. for it. Well, and I think that's, for people who maybe don't read a lot of poetry don't realize how quickly we poets start fictionalizing. You right. know, it may be right. almost everything in there happened, but our, imagining of it is is, is our own yeah. yeah yeah it's completely different so i think that showed me that she really doesn't understand the creative process uh -huh. um so i don't really show things to her mm -hmm. anymore right yeah that being said would you mind finish reading yeah, <laughs> yeah. our mother of sorrows sure. is, is in, uh, um, and this next poem is about my sister lisa but i think the rest are Pretty obvious, yeah. Okay. Okay, four. Lisa began to erase herself when she was so small. More hair, dark and curly, permanently tan skin, caramel. It was the wrong color. It was mommy's color as a child, she told us. Lisa began and then she erased, redrafting again and again. She got into the car and told no one. The dog didn't bark, and we missed her laughter in the silent summer. Hot and quiet and no drama, no giggles and squeaks. She could imitate any voice, but she could not obey. She got into the car without telling mommy or us. The police came in the daylight, sirens announcing danger to the neighborhood. No one knew what she wore, what she looked like, where she was playing. I doubled over with guilt, eating my stomach like a living thing. My sister, it was my fault she had gone away. Five, do you want a lickin'? I didn't understand the word. My tiny self could almost see the letters before I knew them, before I could form the cutting words I would give to my mother in adolescence, broken bottles of sound. But what was a lickin'? I imagined it with an O, oh, lick on, or something crabby and scabby, lichen. It was not a soft word, but the smack was always muted by clothing, the dull thud. This time I had crumpled up all her cigarettes. Oh, the money, she screamed, the waste. 
but I could not tell her I was afraid when she became the dragon, smoke blowing through her nostrils. Six, the dead baby did not haunt us in the usual ways. There were no white sheets in the darkness, no creaky floorboards. She told us at Christmas one year, showed us hanging from the tree, an ornament, round, an angel inside, wings spread wide, to commemorate, remember the small bundle they buried one day in someone else's grave. No, he did not lurk in the shadows of the too small house. There was no room for him. He was still inside her, and we could not take his place. He had come first but left. We had not deserved him. He died to make room for the unworthy. God took him from our unkindness. It was a punishment to know this, that we were only girls who didn't deserve the son, the brother. Seven. Dad often brought pizza on Friday afternoons before the 3 to 11 shift. It was a church basement from their old neighborhood down the rocks. Our Lady of Sorrows, the pizza, for our Mother of Sorrows. She washed the dirt, the sweat from our little bodies each night. I helped her bathe my sister in the sink with the dishes. I kept the suds from her eyes, pulled out the forks and knives before they stabbed her chubby skin, so fresh and fragile. Mm, so fresh and fragile, yeah. Wow. So I, I just feel completely immersed in the world that, that you've created there. Thank you. Um, if you're just joining us, Nina Clemens just read from her poem, Our Mother of Sorrows, um, soon to be a book length uh, poem. Yes. Um, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about your work as a librarian. Sure. Um, because, um, you know, librarians do so much, as you well know. Um, we're sad to be losing you here from the uh, Central Coast. You're leaving Channel Islands to go yes. to the University of Wisconsin at Mass? Yes, yeah. that's right. So what, what have you been doing and what will you be doing now? So uh, right now I'm kind of a generalist. Mm -hmm. um, so I work with all kinds of disciplines and teach information literacy classes. So basically a professor brings her class to the library and I teach the students how to use like sociology resources sure. or art history resources. Um, but I'm gonna be doing that only for English and humanities majors very soon. Okay. So I'll be really working with um, English undergrads, advanced students, and graduate students. Okay. Maybe even some MFA students. <laughs> that would be great. That yeah. would be really exciting. <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, uh, feminism and, and social justice are, are part of your work as a librarian. How does that infuse itself into what you're doing? Yeah, well, I think um, those are just my perspectives, mm -hmm. and I kind of bring them to bear on everything I do. I'm working on a book right now on um, art and social justice at the intersection of librarianship, so people who do more sort of outreach-like events um, for example, for instance, yeah. yeah, for example, one of the contributors, it's an edited collection, mm -hmm. and one of the contributors um, does an art plus women uh, Wikipedia edit-a-thon. Oh. So things like that that just make people more aware that, yeah, Wikipedia is primarily male, uh -huh. um, and a lot of the content is very male. So. And so the women just go in and, and re-edit with a, an eye to yeah. justice. Yes, exactly. So that's one type of event. Um, and so and I guess I've done, as a librarian at other places, I've done other types of events to get people more involved um, and to sort of expand the notion of what libraries do. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, when I worked at Penn State, I hosted National Novel Writing Month events. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah, and um, some book art events. So a great way to get the MFA, MLS uh, yes. <laughs> to work in conjunction. Exactly, exactly. So I'm hoping that those things sort of dovetail more in my next position. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's Poetry Mania <laughs> day, <laughs> Nina. So let's, let's kind of, I, I know you still have some, some other poems. I want to hear some more, some more work from you. Yeah, thank you. Um, this one is called Morning Ablutions. Go to the sink and wash your hands with ants. They itch, but they're good for the grit. They are small and brown-black. You have driven across the country with no bath, leaving everyone, the husband most of all. 
Now, California. Look in the mirror. Ants crawl up your arms to your face and you scrub again, dirt falling away at last. Can you hold that book up for the camera? Oh, I mean, yeah. it's a cool little book. Uh, talk it's the about pen that. review. Uh -huh. It's the pen review. And um, so this is what they're, I, I can't remember, I guess it's volume third, 49, mm -hmm. issue one of the pen review. And it's, they printed it you know, on these small little pages. Right. It's a really neat yeah. publication. Well, publication is something that a lot of aspiring poets are really focused on, and I think rightly so. Um, any tips about how to get published? Yeah, I think just, um, you know, when I was younger, I was really afraid to send my work out. Okay. And I wish I could go back in time and kind of undo that. Mm -hmm. So I think just set, setting aside a dedicated amount of time, not just to write, but to send out your work for publication is really important. How do you find out where to send your work? Um, I just read different publications. Like I'll go to the literary magazine section at Barnes and Noble and look at what mm -hmm. they have, mm -hmm. or any bookstore really. Mm -hmm. um, I also subscribe to poets and writers, so I find out about publications that way. A lot of advertisements for magazines yeah. there. Yeah. I suppose if you were a Channel Island, Channel Island student, you could go to the. Uh, periodicals uh, section? Not, not so much. There's not really much of a periodical <laughs> section left in our library, unfortunately. You could drive up to UCSB and, right. and take a peek right. there. They have a pretty pretty robust section. Right, yeah. exactly. Uh, but it, it, it's funny because um, hard copy periodicals can be hard to come by. You they know? can be hard um, to come by. They're not as hard to come by online it, if you just want to read a sample poem or two or three from individual issues. So that's another way right. people can find out you know, where do I send it? Do I do my poems match up with this particular aesthetic of right. this editor? Yeah. Right. But I guess I err on the side of um, no longer caution. You know, if I even think there's a slight chance of a match, I send it. Yeah. I send it out. Yeah. Well, the worst thing that can happen is they say no. Right. And that is. And, and usually is they do it in a polite way too. They are usually very polite. <laughs> yeah. It's usually pretty painless. Yeah. Poets are so polite. <laughs> <laughs> well, not all poets are. No. Uh, we just have about um, five minutes left. Um, so how many more poems do you think we can squeeze in on uh -huh. our, our Poetry Mania Day? Let's see here. I have, I have a few more. This one um, I think is a formal poem. I think it's a pantoum. OK. Um, and it's untitled, but it's also in my collection, Our Mother of Sorrows. Okay. Oh, mommy is the snake but I want her. She planted impatience in her garden, crouching low, hands deep in dirt. She planted what would grow, a border to our sad home. She planted impatience in her garden each year. It was an anniversary that would grow, a border to our sad home. She hung the laundry to dry on the deck. Each year, it was an anniversary. She refused what others would celebrate, she hung the laundry to dry on the deck and hid in bed, curtains drawn against us. She refused what others would celebrate, crouching low, hands deep in dirt, she planted. She hid in bed, curtains drawn against us. Oh, mommy is a snake, but I want her. Mm. And then maybe another mom poem. The day after the bourbon and the phone, a new pot of tea, strong, dark as acid, bitter but awake. The tea is alive inside me. It can't erase the words of the mother. That takes patience, which does not come from her. The beauty of the notebook in the morning, the tea next to white blank pages, it is waiting. When she dies, there will be no more phone calls, and you will likely miss them. Miss the narcissus in a vase on your table, a reminder. And then maybe a couple of poems about ants. We got maybe time for one more. I one would say. more. Yeah. All right, let's let's do one more. This is called Ants in the Bed. The ants are in the bed now, thanks to the cat. They've come for her because she is weak always in repose. She's what I have since you left me alone. You could not kill the ants any more than my sick cat who laps one up with her dinner now and then. 
She looks almost wild. Her fur is matted and her eye and her wide eyes drip. You would hardly know her, hardly know either of us. She is barely there, but more real than you have been this year. When she goes, who will remind me of you? Wow. So in that sort of what, 90 seconds <laughs> we have left, I think yeah. oh, maybe it's a little bit longer than that, maybe two minutes. I, I want to hear you draw on your MFA, your long career as a, as a writer, and just give some advice to aspiring poets out there. Yeah, I guess my main advice is to find a community of writers, find a few people who you can trust um, and who you can get together with regularly and share your work. And how do you do that? Because you came here just out to California, you didn't know anybody, didn't right? Know anybody. How did you find those people? I found them by going to different workshops. Okay. I found out about the Ventura um, poets and the Thursday night reading by doing a workshop when I lived in Claremont and I met an LA poet who told mm -hmm. me about Marsha and Phil mm -hmm. and then I just kind of looked them up on Facebook and started going to the Thursday night readings. So this show's producer could be a, a, a good uh, um, yes. good resource, yeah. So, so it, you actually have to look and go there and be there physically, I think, present, right? Yes, but I, I mean, I, I don't go every week, but I met people there met that people. I would then sort of exchange things with. Uh -huh. um, and I think I found out about my writing group from that, okay. from that group of people. So, and even when I was at Claremont, I found a couple poets and we had sort of an informal writing group. Mm -hmm. And that's just been tremendous. Okay. That's really helped me. Any other piece of advice? Keep writing. Yeah? Keep writing, no matter what. H how do you do that? Um, I write every morning. Okay. Um, I did something called The Artist's Way. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard of that uh -huh. book, but it's a really fun way to rediscover your creativity. I do know that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's a really fun way to like yeah. recover your creativity. Right. And that just got me into the habit of writing three pages of randomness every morning, and then I would make those into poems. Into your poems. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your poems on Poetry Mania Day <laughs> and for your <laughs> advice and all your good words. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. The Creative Community is a co-production of CAPS Media and TVSB. Here in Ventura, it's produced by Phil Taggart and his great crew. I'm your host, David Starkey, and we'll see you next time. The bee and the wasp. There is a buzzing, close, nestled behind the ear. Is it the bee or is it the wasp? The voice will spare you nothing. For the daughter, nothing. I think you're my daughter, she says, but she can't be sure. You are both peeling skin from the soles of your feet, but she will not call your flesh her own. Instead, you walk barefoot in the gravel. The pebbles in your wounds remind you that you can feel. Blood flows from your heels. You want the bee who can hurt you only once, who spends her life guarding her one perfect threat. But wasps, they sting and sting, wings singing as the phone rings.